you are a child of God and I am a child of God. You are suffering and because you suffer, I must suffer too. Preaching at St. James Episcopal Church in his hometown of Keene, New Hampshire in January 1963, Jonathan Daniels summarized the gospel's call to ministry just more than two years before that call brought him to a martyr's death in Alabama. Fifty years after his death, Jonathan Daniels lives on in Keene's memory in many ways. If you visit our school, you'll start standing in this beautiful peace garden that's dedicated to the memory and the honor of Jonathan Daniels and his contributions to not only Keene, but to the larger community. I think we want kids to know the special qualities that Jonathan had, his beliefs and his values, um, so that they can also aspire to be a similar, for us, hometown hero, someone who makes a greater contribution. Looking at the unrest now in our communities, across the world, across the nation, across the street, we want them to understand that they can make a difference, that they should be honest, they should report things that they're concerned about, um, they should advocate for themselves and other people, and then everyone's important. Jonathan Daniels died when he was only 26 mm -hmm. because he went down to Hainville, Alabama, and he was arrested with some of his friends. And then they were walked, they finally were released, and they were going into the store to get a drink, and a policeman met them on the steps, and they, he wouldn't let them go in. So he shot at one of the, his friends, Ruby Sales, but Jonathan Daniels pushed her out of the way and got shot. And he didn't really believe in violence and he thought that violence just made things even worse. Now, what's the hardest part of trying to live like Jonathan Daniels? Making the decisions he made and sort of like trying to always remember that everyone's equal and that everyone should be treated the same way. People are joining this church because of, of the ministry that they see here. And I still really am convinced that a lot of that ministry grows out of a desire to, to, uh, to try and live into uh, a vision that, that Jonathan offered us here and, and the, uh, the larger church as well. Uh, there's a recording of a sermon that he gave here for a theological education Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks about the gospel and he stops himself in the middle of this, uh, of what he's saying. He says, you know this. I don't need to tell you this, you taught it to me. We who are members and corporate of the living body of Christ know the difference between life and death. And we know who makes the difference. He already knew that he was dead, that he had already died, and that he was also alive with Christ. And that, that gave him a kind of immunity to physical harm, to violence, to ridicule, to all of the things that he became vulnerable to in, in Selma and then Hainville. He said, I want to be a witness. And he meant it, I think, in the Greek sense of, of, um, of a, a, a living um, memorial to what was going on in the South. He wanted to be a conduit of that information back. We always hear about the very public and horrid event of him being shot and taking the blast of Tom Coleman's shotgun protecting Ruby Sales. But behind that was this, this, this relationship he had with the West family. He stayed with them for mm -hmm. months. He became their adopted child and brother and son. And um, in some ways that was the real vulnerability. That was the real witness of Jonathan Daniels. He saw it at a different level than the rest of us. I mean, I hate to sound like that because I know that he's got friends here in Keene and he was just Jonathan Daniels who, who smoked cigarettes with them and went dates and raced cars around and all that. But all saints did that. All saints had feet of clay. Otherwise they wouldn't be saints. Um, it's just true that out of experience and, and pain come, um, come these transformations. Just in the, the five years that I've been here, he is moving from native son to, uh, you know, the old phrase of belonging to the ages and, uh, and is becoming more and more larger than life in, this, in the way saints develop mm. uh, out of communities that knew them and experienced their, their holiness or however that was expressed. And then gradually the church comes to recognize that, uh, that sanctity.
There's another thing I've heard from people who've known, people who've known Jonathan and who have really become well versed in the whole story is there is a caveat, there's, a, there's an anxiety about what, you, what, what happens to somebody when they become a saint right. and that suddenly their humanity gets drained out of them and that here is a person, you see those photographs, here's a living, breathing young man who had a lot of things that were still probably not sorted out in mm -hmm. his life. Um, he's not a two-dimensional figure. He was probably in some ways very conflicted about many things, but not about his love for humankind and for God. Mm. Uh, there's this worry among people in the church that, that by making a shrine and putting it in the corner, that we do that with, with him in our lives, um, instead of really allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to the power of the Holy Spirit to, to transform us. For Episcopal News Service, I'm Mary Frances Schonberg.